Welcome everyone to another episode of the Gold Silver Bitcoin Show brought to you by the goldsilverbitcoin.com store at goldsilverbitcoin.com. We are super stoked today to have Steve Penny on the show. Steve is a charting expert. He also is known as the silver chartist and he has really made a splash in that silver industry, which is a very enthusiastic industry with a lot of people in it. I think in terms of volume, when I put out content, on the internet over the last 10 years about precious metals seems like there's just more people more eyeballs on silver than on gold and now of course while there are fewer eyeballs on gold those pockets tend to be a little bit deeper on that side of things i think which balances things out or or kind of uh makes the market appear as it does on those two fronts so steve thanks for joining us today you bet justin thanks so much for inviting me on it was a pleasure to meet you in person at the uh silver symposium back in the fall so it's nice to connect with you again and um uh, I agree with everything you just said about silver there, you know, especially with a loyal following because silver is about the only asset class I can think of that's trended lower over the past, you know, 12 to 18 months. Um, I think that's going to change soon, but we can talk about that. You mentioned silver symposium that was put on by Stockpulse at stockpulse.com and that will be happening again this year, I believe in June. So stay tuned. I think in Spokane, Washington as well, a little closer to the airport this time. So Steve, charting i want to talk about charting first i want to start with what led you to charting not necessarily uh you know as you were older but maybe as a child did you have certain interests which lent it lent themselves well to charting no so i i began uh getting really fascinated with the financial markets back in 2007 and 8 around the time of the great financial crisis and when, once i learned how the federal reserve works and how debt-based fiat currency is essentially lent into existence by a private entity, no, otherwise known as the Federal Reserve. You know, I was just fascinated. And my background really is in the fundamental aspect of the markets. But it was around 2015 or 16 that I, I found myself just having to read so much information to keep up with what was happening on a fundamental basis. And what I found with charts, uh, simply price and volume overlaid on a chart, is that there's information density there. And I can often find out more information about what's going on by simply looking at a chart than I can with reading some 30 page report. Although I still enjoy doing that. I just, I like charting for that information density. So maybe you can, you work backwards, you look at a chart and then what, I, I guess to put it, use your terms, like where is information densest on the charts at which points, whether they be patterns or otherwise. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so in information density, you can, everyone on Wall Street has an incentive, right? So you might read a report by some Wall Street bank or some newsletter and everyone's got an agenda. Well, with price and volume overlaid on a chart, no one can cover up their tracks. You know, you can literally see what the big money is doing. And, you know, that uh, there's a saying that price and volume precede the news. So you can often see that an event is taking fold prior to the news headlines that, you know, explain that price action. And I, I, another saying I like to have is that uh, fundamentals tell me what to buy and technicals can help me identify when to buy and when to sell. So, you know, my, my investing is based on fundamentals, but timing is based on technicals. So you see some event on the chart, some new story is developing. Now, where do you go from there? Um, well, it depends for me personally, I'm, I'm a chart based trader. So I use entry and exit signals. So the first thing I look at on a chart is where is price relative to the 200 day moving average? That may sound overly simplistic, but that's the first place my eyes go. And if price is above a rising 200 day moving average, that, that tells me the stock is in a general uptrend and that most of the algorithms and institutions that really drive the prices of these markets are tend to be in a buy the dip mode because most most trading is done by these high frequency trading algorithms. It's not humans. I like to call them carbon based traders. It's algorithms. And when price is above a rising 200 day moving average, those algorithms tend to be in a buy the dip mode. Conversely, if price is below a declining 200 day moving average, um, you know, those algorithms tend to be in a sell the rally mode. So that, that's the first place my eyes go. And then the second thing I look for is any clear patterns. And I want to emphasize the word clear because some, you see people on Twitter, you know, drawing these patterns where it cuts through all lines, cut through all kinds of price bars. Um, it has to be obvious uh, for the pattern to be valid. Um, so I look for any obvious patterns and often there's not one. And if there's not one, you wait until one forms. Um, so that's kind of a synopsis of how I look at a chart. Why the 200 day moving average? 
simply because it, it's the most used input to those algorithms. Um, almost every anyone who uses charts is going to overlay a 200-day moving average. So it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Not that there's anything magical about the 200-day moving average. It, it's just the most used input. That's all. What is high-frequency trading and how has that changed the game? Well, high-frequency trading, the, these big banks have these massive computers right next to the exchange. In fact, they they bid over and they fight over who gets to have their computer like closest to the exchange because these milliseconds matter. And they're algorithms that trade automatically based on, you know, inputs that are programmed into them. And, um, you, you know, they can get pretty complicated, but basically, you know, that 200 day moving average is an input. We can see that evidenced uh, on a daily basis for anyone who watches charts. You mentioned obvious. What defines an obvious event when you're looking at a chart? What does obvious mean? Well, um, it, it, anyone who's new to trading, these patterns are not obvious. You, you have to train your eyes to see them. However, um, like for example, I like to trade triangle patterns. So a triangle pattern is just like it sounds. You've got a descending uh, resistance line and an ascending support line, and they converge at an apex. Well, if those lines cut through different price bars, that's not obvious. You're, you're forcing it. So it would, you know, I like to say it, the line should touch the extremes. So, you know, you, you want the support and resistance to only touch the extremes of the price bars in whatever time frame you're looking at. And that makes it obvious. If it cuts through all kinds of price bars, that's invalid. Where did you start? Like, what are the fundamentals? What are some of the first things you learned that help you build a foundation for understanding charts? Yeah, I, I was really blessed to have a, a great mentor, um, someone who I worked with and worked alongside at Follow the Money. Um, Jerry Robinson is his name. But, you know, he pointed me to some really good books. And your listeners may be familiar with stockcharts.com. Uh, John Murphy, I don't think he's the founder, but he's one of the you know, head up guys there. He, he wrote a big, thick textbook. It's called Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets. And some people call that the encyclopedia or the Bible of technical analysis. So I, I try and read that thing every year. And it's just packed with good information. It's dense reading, but it's very useful information. It's practical. And it's, um, you know, it's very accurate. So that's one book. Another one is um, The New Trading for a Living by Dr. Alexander Elder. And th that's a great one as far as risk management and how to uh, tr trade for a living and, uh, you know, wrapping your mind around the psychology of it because psychology is a, is a major factor when it comes to trading and investing as well. So th those two books are, have, were key for me. What are some of the things that you first picked up on while you were reading those books? <clears throat> I guess... I was just fascinated with just how important technical analysis is. Um, like I said, you know, I, I found myself reading these 30, 40 page reports on a given subject when I could f see the same information in a price chart. Um, and then it's just a matter of training your eyes to see it. Um, so th that's really what I, what I found so fascinating. And now every, every time I read a piece of information, um, someone's opinion, whatever, a research report, the first thing I do is go look at a chart and see if that information is already priced in. So for example, you might read some really bullish information on a stock or a sector, and then you go look at the chart and it's priced in. If, if that stock's already moved way up, well, then the market's already recognized this good news that I just read about. Um, and you know, I like to say there's a when there's a delta between price and uh, value, that's where opportunity exists. So what we wanna do is find opportunities that are, you know, either bullish or bearish, but the, the price action hasn't reflected that yet. And that's, that's where charts can help identify those opportunities. So I'm on technical analysis at Wikipedia. So there's some principles, a core principle of technical analysis that a market's price reflects all relevant information impacting that market. A technical analysis therefore looks at the history of a security or commodities trading pattern rather than external drivers such as economic, fundamental, and news events. It is believed that price action tends to repeat itself due to the collective patterned behavior of investors. Hence, technical analysis focuses on identifiable price trends and conditions. So the first heading here is market action discounts everything based on the premise that all relevant information is already reflected by prices. Technical analysis believe it is important to understand what investors think of that information known and perceived. Does that conjure up any ideas in your head, any of this uh, that I've read? It does, and uh, there's a hypothesis. It's called the efficient market hypothesis, and I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I do think markets are efficient most of the time, but when they're not, that's where opportunity presents itself, and that's 
like we're, uh, you know, having a grasp of the fundamentals and the technicals can help you identify where the markets are not priced efficiently. And that's where those opportunities come in. Um, so yeah, that's my short thoughts on, on that excerpt. What are your long thoughts on that excerpt? Well, um, <laughs> I guess there's really not more to, much more to add. I think markets are efficient most of the time. However, if you, um, you know, my trading mentor used to call it like, uh, I'm not a hunter, but, um, you know, if you're hunting a deer, you know, you just sit there and you wait and you're waiting for that deer to come right into your crosshairs. And most of the time and you're waiting for those inefficiency to present themselves. And once you spot them, that's when you take your shot. You're, you're looking for opportunity where, you know, the markets are not efficient, although they are the vast majority of the time. So the second header under principles, I'm just reading the Wikipedia page sure. here, is a technical analysis believe that prices trend directionally up, down, or sideways, flat, or some combination there. The basic definition of a price trend was originally put forward by Dow Theory. An example of a security that had an apparent trend is AOL from November 2001 through August 2002. A technical analysis or trend follower recognizing this trend will look for opportunities to sell this security. AOE, AOL consistently moves downward in price. Each time the stock rose, sellers would enter the market and sell the stock, hence the zigzag movement in the price. The series of lower highs and lower lows is a tail, tail sign of a stock in a downtrend. In other words, each time the stock moved lower, it fell below its previous relative low price. Each time the stock moved higher, it could not reach the level of its previous relative high price. Note that the sequence of lower lows and lower highs did not begin until August. Then AOL makes a low price that does not pierce the relative low set earlier in the month. Later in the same month, the stock makes a relative high equal to the most recent relative high. In this, a technician sees strong indications that the downtrend is at least pausing and possibly ending and would likely stop actively selling the stock at that point. And I'll put the chart up uh, in post-production. Sure. Any, any thoughts on any of that? Yes. Um, I, th I don't want to uh, make it too broad of an assumption, but... It I would assume most silver and gold investors, even Bitcoin investors, are contrarians at heart. You know, we like to buy things that are hated or things that have gone way up. You know, we like to sell them. However, if you're trading on a shorter time frame, it's important to trade alongside the trend. And the simplest definition of an uptrend, like you read there, is a, a series of higher highs and higher lows. A trend in motion tends to stay in motion. So you're setting yourself up for success with the shorter term trades by trading with the trend until you see some clear and obvious bottoming pattern occur. And often that a break of trend is marked by, you know, in a downtrend, like you just described, the first higher high, that that's an early sign that perhaps the trend is reversing. And just having a basic understanding of these concepts can really give you a leg up in your trading and investing. Um, what are some of the core fundamentals that you took from some of this early once you realize, wow, technical analysis is so important, it reflects the news, it's got information density. What were some of the first patterns that you saw past triangles, if you will, which you mentioned already? Yeah, and you don't need to know all of the patterns. Um, but a couple of patterns that I really like, you mentioned triangle patterns. I like uh, reverse head and shoulders patterns. Um, I like... Th there's another pattern that's very highly accurate. It's called an ascending wedge where it's kind of a flat... Uh, resistance line and then you know a tr up trending line so it's they call it a d ascending triangle that's a pattern i really like um so th th there there's several patterns but uh it, if you combine those along with uh candlestick patterns there's different kinds of candlesticks as well the the more evidence you have to kind of confirm a thesis the more pieces that fit together the more accurate you're going to be over time and another thing that i've learned is that uh, patterns and signals tend to be more accurate. I call it the pre-signal zone. So for example, your RSI, relative strength ind index, that tells you when a stock is overbought or oversold. If it's above 70, it's generally considered overbought. Below 30 is oversold. So if you get a reversal pattern with the RSI at one of those extremes, that pattern is much more statistically likely to be valid than if it were just trending sideways and then you get a symmetrical triangle pattern kind of in the middle of sideways chop. That's not very relevant. But if you get a... Um, a clear reversal pattern, let's say a head and shoulders top with the RSI in way overbought territory, that pattern is going to be statistically much more viable. Over on Wikipedia, we see that, quote, history tends to repeat itself. Technical analysis believe that investors collectively repeat the behavior of the investors that preceded them. To a technician, 
The emotions of the market may be irrational, but they exist because investor behavior repeats itself so often. Technicians believe that recognizable and predictable price patterns will develop on a chart. Recognition of these patterns can allow the technician to select trades that have a higher probability of success. Technical analysis is not limited to charting, but it always considers price trends. For example, many technicians monitor surveys of investor sentiment. These surveys gauge the attitude of market participants, specific, specifically whether they are bearish or bullish. Technicians use these surveys to help determine whether a trend will continue or if a reversal could develop. They are most likely to anticipate a change when the surveys report extreme investor sentiment. Surveys that show overwhelming bullishness, for example, are evidence that an up, uptrend may soon reverse. The premise being that if most investors are bullish, they have already bought the market, anticipating higher prices. And because most investors are bullish and invested, one assumes that few buyers remain. This leaves more potential sellers than buyers, despite the bullish sentiment. This suggests that prices will trend down. And this is an example of contrarian trading. Does any of that ring true to you? And then also, can we go into what contrarian trading is? Sure. Uh, yeah, that, that definitely resonates with me. And I think that that's another way of another tool to kind of measure what I was just talking about there with, um, you know, RSI being overbought or oversold. And, you know, with, with newer technical analysts, I used to be like this. So the tendency is to get inundated with using all of these different indicators. And then next thing you know, your chart is clogged up with 30 different indicators. Um, so I, I would find two or three, maybe four at the most that, that resonate with you and try and tune out the noise. So as far as sentiment, um, I, I just use the RSI very more often than not. If your RSI is above 70, you know, think sentiment is, uh, irrationally exuberant at the time <laughs> where if sentiments below, or excuse me, RSI is below 30, you know, it's, uh, tends to be irrational in the other direction. Um, and, and you had a second part to that question. Can you, can you remind me that? What is contrarian trading? Um, yeah, contrarian trading is simply going against the, the, the herd or most investors, general investor sentiment. So for example, right now, um, you know, uh, tech stocks have been in a multi-year uptrend. Well, if you're going to bet against those, you're being a contrarian because you're going against the herd. I think uh, on an opposite um, you know, uh, viewpoint, silver is a contrarian investment because it's done nothing but go down for 18 months. So that's what contrarian investing is. Um, for me personally, I like to consider myself a contrarian investor where I've got a longer time frame and I can pre pre be prepared to be wrong for periods of time where if I'm short term trading, uh, you know, that it's tough to be a contrarian trader because <laughs> you're betting against the trend. So on the shorter time frames, I like to trade with the trend, longer term time frames. Uh, I'm, I consider myself a contrarian where I, you know, if, if it continues to move against me, I average down and I'm willing to just sit and wait, even if it takes a couple years. So you mentioned to avoid paralysis of analysis, focus on just a few, uh, I guess, signals. So can you speak to what the, the two, three or four signals are that you are looking at at any given time? Well, the, the longer you've been doing it, the, the more tools you have in your toolbox. So there's, there's dozens of things I, I look at as far as signals, but here's a simple one above a, we talked about triangle patterns. A lot of people, I think mistakenly use technical analysis as a predictive tool, which it is. However, most patterns, even the most reliable patterns are accurate, maybe two thirds of the time at best. However, what technicals can allow you to do is manage risk. So rather than, um, you know, triangle patterns tend to be continuation patterns. In, in other words, they tend to break in the direction of the prevailing trend. So rather than just buy now and say, I think there's a two thirds chance we're going to break higher. You could wait, wait for confirmation, wait until you break above the upper rail of a triangle pattern and that's your buy signal. And then you would place your stop loss, you know, somewhere below the recent lows. So that's, that's one signal. You wait for the price action to prove your thesis and then you buy. Um, so that, that's one example. So back to uh, the Wikipedia page, we're looking at the back testing next. So you got paralysis of analysis. You've got you said, a sort of approach that you can make sense of now. How do you test your theories and strategies and then adjust? Yep, it's it's so important to do that because a trader is constantly refining their rules and their systems and their processes. Um, intuition is a part of it, but I think it's a relatively small part. So it's important as a trader, shorter term trader, to keep uh, a, a you know a diary of not only your wins and losses, but the setups that you use to trade. 
and what your results were. And then over time, you can change, adjust your rules to become a more efficient and more profitable trader. We've seen a rise of the Robinhood trader. So there's so much to learn. I think there's a lot of opportunity, but there's a lot of risk as well with that. And I think we've seen some of that play out already. So there's these basic principles of uh, technical analysis and markets. Really, I think now we're really more talking about economics, perhaps or finance. So there's price, volume, and open interest. Can you speak to like uh, what volume and open interest means? Sure. Um, so price is obviously just the price. Volume is the number of shares that are traded. And open interest is more of a function for futures markets. So I'm, I'm not a futures trader. So I, I don't want to um, go outside of my area expertise, but it's similar to volume. Um, but uh, price and volume are the two most important, you know, obviously, indicators on a chart. Everything else is based on price and volume. Um, and by the way, whenever you see a pattern and then a breakout, my eyes immediately go to the bottom of the chart and look at volume because higher than average volume confirms the breakout or confirms the technical pattern. And that's an indication of those uh, inside institutions, insider institutions, putting their money where they think, you know, the markets are going to move. Big volume is not retail traders like you and I. If you see a big spike in volume, that's an institution. And, you know, they, they're smart traders. And if we try and compete with them based on our knowledge of fundamentals, we're going to lose because they've got access to more information and they probably know it sooner than we do. But we can see it on a chart, um, you know, w by price and volume. So in a paper published in the Journal of Finance, Dr. Andrew W. Lowe, Director of MIT Laboratory for Financial Engineering, working with Harry Mamaski and Jiang Wang, found that, quote, Technical analysis, also known as charting, has been a part of the financial practice for many decades, but this discipline has not received the same level of academic scrutiny and acceptance as more traditional approaches, such as fundamental analysis. One of the main obstacles is the highly subjective nature of technical analysis. The presence of geometric shapes and historical price charts is often in the eyes of the beholder. In this paper, we propose a systematic and automatic approach to technical pattern recognition using non-parametric kernel regression and apply this method to a large number of U.S. St US stocks from 1962 to 1996 to evaluate the effectiveness of technical analysis. By comparing the unconditional empirical distribution of daily stock returns to the conditional distribution conditioned on specific technical indicators such as head and shoulders or double bottoms, we find that over the 31-year sample period, several technical indicators do provide incremental information and may have some practical value. So do you have any thoughts on that generally? They also bring up fundamental analysis. Maybe we could talk about how that differs from technical analysis. And they also applied this study, non-parametric kernel regression, not sure if you know what that is, to a large number of U.S. stocks from 1962 to 1996. So do you ever also look at these long-term long pyramids and take a step back? Any thoughts? Uh, so as far as that parametric regression, that's not something I'm familiar with, um, but it sounds like they built an algorithm that trades based on technical indicators in a, a, with their objective to outperform the market. Um, yeah, I mean, I would agree with most of that, that technical analysis is admittedly subjective. Um, most traders do lose money, but what, you, what I found is that the small minority of traders who are consistently profitable, they do the same things. They have the same things in common. In other words, they have a system, they have rules, they manage risk. Um, they've got maximum losses that they're willing to take. They're very disciplined and systematic and they treat their trading like a business where your average Robin Hood trader, you know, that you mentioned before, um, I like to do this because people, you know, learn that I trade and they say, oh, I trade too. And I go, oh, well, cool. What's your system? And th they don't have one. <laughs> well, how do you choose stocks? to trade. Uh, they, they have no system at all. And that unfortunately is 90% of the retail traders. So, you know, I think that accounts for why most traders fail is they don't have systems and rules and processes. How do you, how do you manage risk? Uh, I've got rules. So one, one of my rules is I will never allow myself to risk more than 2% of my total trading capital on a single trade. So for easy math, if you've got a hundred thousand dollar account, I mean, that would be a pretty big trading account. But in, in such an example, you would never risk more than $2,000. Um, on a $10,000 account, you wouldn't risk more than $200. And that doesn't mean you're only trading $200. It means that your position size and your stop loss are such that if you get stopped out, 
you won't lose more than $200 on a $10,000 trading account on any single trade. And an another way to manage risk is thinking in terms of risk reward. Every time I take a trade, I, I want it, my risk uh, to be at least half my potential reward. In other words, I want my potential reward to be two times or more my, my risk. So if I'm risking $200 by placing my stop loss, I want my upside potential to be at least 400. And it, it, under those scenarios, you can be wrong more than half the time and still be a profitable trader. If your average winner is two times the size of your average loser, you can be wrong two thirds of the time and still be profitable. And I, I don't think it's very well known that some of the most successful traders in the world, uh, multi multi millionaires are wrong more than half the time. It's just they keep their losses really small. There's a saying, let your winners run, but keep your losses small. And easier that's easier said than done, but it's you know something you have to learn to do to be a, a profitable trader over the long term. So I feel most comfortable really yeah, in terms of specific trades with those that are multi-month long trades. I don't know what that's called. It's maybe trend trading or swing mm -hmm. trade, perhaps. Uh First, do you know, do you off the top of your head, are you aware of the, the three, I guess, different types of uh, timelines uh, for trading and what they yeah, are? I think, yeah. And, and these definitions are admittedly subjective, but these are kind of the consensus definition. So number one is day trading. That's where you're buying and selling in the same day. Day traders do not hold positions overnight. Swing trading is usually days to weeks. Um, that That's swing trading. And you're looking for consistent singles, you know, sm smaller profits over shorter periods of time. And then what you referred to, most people would consider position trading. And that's where you're holding a position for weeks to uh, up to a handful of months, maybe even a year. Um, that's position trading. And then finally, you've got longer term investing. That's, you know, multi-year timeframes. And it's it's important to define that, what kind of trader you want to be if you're into trading. Uh, again, speaking about the Robinhood traders, you know, you ask them, well, what kind of trader are you? They, they don't typically have an answer to that question. <laughs> Which are you? Uh, I do all of, all, all of the above. However, whenever I initiate a trade, I know exactly. I, I like to say whenever you push the buy button, you need to have a subsequent plan to push the sell button. So I don't start off planning for it to be a swing trade and then turn it into a long-term investment. <laughs> a lot of new traders, you know, when a trade moves against them, they say, oh, you know, I'm just going to move this over and consider this an investment. Uh, you, can't, you can't do that. So uh, I like to swing trade where I hold any, you know, positions for, you know, three to 10 days. And the goal there is just monthly cash flow, you know, consistent singles, one to 10% profits. Um, position trades, I do those occasionally where I'll hold for a few months, but th those are less common for me. So I, I like to swing trade and then longer term invest. What's the difference between each? When you go into a day trade, like what's a typical plan to press the buy and press the sell? Uh, I don't day trade as much as I used to, although I, I still do. I was actually just day trading this morning um, a little bit. So with with day trading, the advantage of day trading is that because you should be there watching very closely, you can take a much larger position size and have a much tighter stop loss. You can manage your risk much more efficiently because you don't have what's called overnight risk. Swing trading, you know, the market's closed for 16 hours a day or 17 hours a day. And, um, you know, the, it can gap against you. So that's a, that's a risk. With day trading, you can take much larger position sizes and still make the same amount of money with a much smaller percentage move. So um, I'm not sure if I answered your question there, but that, that's how I think about day trading. Mm -hmm. uh, any differences with swing or uh, kind of long-term uh, trading? Yes. Um, I guess he, here's a thought is to manage risk effectively, if you're going to never risk more than 2% of your total trading capital, your position size should be inversely proportional to the size of your stop loss or the width of your stop loss. So in other words, you can take a, a pretty big position if you're going to have a really tight stop loss, because that, that would allow you to still risk just 2% of your capital. However, if you're going to have a really wide stop loss, then you better be taking a smaller position size. Because if you're wrong, you don't want to lose all that money. Um, so that's one way to think about it. The longer my time frame, typically I have a smaller position size with a wider stop loss where, you know, zeroing in on a day trade that I plan to hold for an hour, really big position size, but super tight stop loss. If I'm wrong, boom, I mean, I'm out right away for a small loss. Any other comments on particularly technicals and charting that you think people maybe have misconceptions about, get hurt on, or are ignorant of? Um. Well, I think there's a lot of a lot of potential pitfalls. 
So here's my process for anyone who wants to learn how to trade. You know, number one, I think you need to get some education, um, whether that's paying for a course, reading books. That's that's the first step. Get some education. And then step number two is trade without using real money. Paper They call it paper trading. Um, get a simulator. Um, some of these nice brokerage accounts like TD, or TD Ameritrade, Thinkorswim, they've got nice simulators where you can practice. And I would say do that for at least two months, probably longer, and prove to yourself that you can be accurate and profitable using not using real money. Once you've done that for a few months, then you can start trading using real money, but takes very small position sizes because there's different psychology when you're using real money. It's, your emotions affect you differently. Um, and then, you know, you can gradually scale, scale that up, but it's very systematic. What most people do is just jump in there with real money. They blow up their account and say, oh, trading doesn't work <laughs> when, you know, they skip the first three steps. So you say that most traders lose money and somebody might use that as an excuse for why trading is bad, but you could say the same thing about starting a business. Most businesses fail. Yes. So now when I, I don't trade, however, I do have ideas and thoughts and I guess I do actually, uh, I don't, I want to call it trading. I, I won't even call it investing. You know, I just have, I, I guess I look at it as uh, I'm a contrarian saver. So mm -hmm. now it's on long-term uh, trends. So while this isn't exactly a, a good example of uh, saving technique, one thesis I had in 2021 was that Dogecoin was going to have a great run. And I was looking at it when it was below one cent. I saw Elon Musk tweeting about it. I saw the Google search interest, which is something I look at trends.google.com. I look at it across um, di disciplines, really, from mm -hmm. politics to, to pricing. And it was very clear that interest had increased quite a bit over the course of t Musk's series of tweets, yet the price seemed low and hadn't really moved as much as you would perhaps that I theorized. So then we ran from under a penny all the way to 70 cents. And then a lot of people were starting to get in there. The, uh, the sentiment was very high, generally speaking in Dogecoin. A lot of people were FOMOing in at that point. However, it had been such a run. I suppose you could have anticipated there would be quite a few sellers in that market. And you had this news event selling the news is an important, uh, idea that people discuss. So, Musk goes on Saturday Night Live and the price crashes. Barry Silbert that morning, which was a service he provided, shorted Dogecoin and he made that announcement. He told, he told Twitter that he was shorting Dogecoin and uh, that you might fare well to do the same. Any thoughts on the Dogecoin run and how it played out? Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm not anti-cryptocurrency it's just not that, that's fine that's good i don't really even want to talk about dogecoin after i asked that i was like why am i talking i'm not talking about dogecoin sure. okay however what I'm, I'm explaining from a trading standpoint that that was a thesis that was a multi-month long thesis that i had that bore out other ones i've had were bitcoin you know that was a longer multi-year one where i thought that it would make sense that uh there's 21 million bitcoins only ever there's increasing popularity as far back as like 2015 it's being mentioned in movies produced by pharrell uh, by 20 i guess 17 or 18 it's in rap songs mm -hmm. uh, probably earlier but like i'm on the radio driving down the street and there's some rapper rapping about bitcoin uh silver was and gold were another one in 2008 2009 so it seemed like that there would be increasing demand for gold and silver especially in the wake of a financial crisis which was ongoing until like 2013 or so i think we never fully recovered from the global financial crisis however we did i think smooth out for a period here ahead of 2020. And so those were just some theses that i had over the years that i think uh are good examples of uh coming up with a hypothesis with reasons and perhaps some empirical evidence google search trends comes to mind for in my in my uh example sure. uh, do you have any examples like those no well uh well first of all con congrats um uh, you know I, I i wish i had participated in the crypto run like <laughs> like you did so well well done um are you still long crypto if you don't mind me asking 
Um, I'm definitely long Bitcoin. I, I see these as two different things. So there's Bitcoin and there's cryptocurrencies. They're literally called altcoins. So like, I don't even talk about altcoins on this show. That's my Bitcoin maximalism show. That's okay. why I cringe when I asked about Dogecoin. I was like, oh, I broke my own rule. <laughs> Don Durrett. Don Durrett came on this show. He's a gold guy, right? And sure. he is uh, doesn't even consider Bitcoin a cryptocurrency. So mm. Bitcoin is its own commodity. And... I see it because it's only cap it's at capped at 21 million yeah. coins with uh, at least uh, probably increasing demand, but at least uh, it seems steady demand has support. I honestly see Steve Bitcoin very reasonably getting to the size of the gold market cap, which is, which would mean a ten trillion dollar market cap, approximately, and five to six hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin. I think that a million dollar Bitcoin is actually quite possible. Hmm. Looking at the chart and where it's been and how improb improbable I thought that this would be, and then taking a step back and looking at its all time chart and seeing where we are in relation to where we've been, it seems like some really big numbers are in the realm of possibility. And demand is only increasing, and I think it's increasing massively. MicroStrategy purchased a bunch of Bitcoin. Tesla, a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin at, at their first go. Is that right? It was a billion dollars, I think. That sounds right, but I don't know exactly. And that was their first go. PayPal starts offering it to the, the public um, with just a few clips. A clicks a coinbase you see their story they have an ongoing story of strength and although i th i think that does tell a story about the retail public perception about first and foremost for the purposes of this show bitcoin so mm -hmm. five hundred thousand is in the realm of possibility one million is in the realm of possibility this is like an increasing uh demand it seems still mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So I guess you, you originally asked, do I have any stories similar to that? Yeah, I do. Um, so like I said, fundamentals tell me what to buy, technicals tell me when to buy. So one is the uranium sector. Um, back in March of 2020, that sector was just beaten down to a pulp. And what's interesting, like uranium makes up 20% of our baseload power here in the United States. And baseload means it's the first 20%, not just 20%. And the incentive price for these miners to produce uranium is well north of fifty dollars, probably north of sixty, and the price was down in the low twenties. Um, so that created just an, an opportunity as a contrarian to invest in a hated sector and just sit and wait. And you know that's that's worked out really well for me. And I think there's still more upside in uranium, but that's my longer term investment. And then I look to the charts and I find, you know, those market inefficiencies using charts, and I short term trade around longer positions. So. That, that's one example that you asked for. So let's turn for the remainder of our time together to silver in particular, and perhaps how silver has demonstrated some of what we've already talked about. Any thoughts on that? Sure. I guess to start with a super high level overview of why I'm so bullish on silver um, is that, and this isn't unique to the United States government, but it, you know, to all Western governments, um, developed governments around the world, is that their debts and unfunded contingent liabilities are just mathematically impossible to replay, be repaid. There's more debt and liabilities in the system than currency in circulation. So it's it's a math problem. You cannot repay these debts with anything you know resembling today's dollars. So that leaves these politicians and central planners with really two choices. They can default honestly, or they can debase the currency. And we've got you know multi millennia of history suggesting that in this exact situation, which we've seen many times, hundreds of times. The, these politicians and central planners always debase the currency and silver and gold are monetary metals and they tend to be the prime beneficiary of this exact um, environment that we've seen multiple times throughout history. Now, it can take longer to play out than many people think, including myself. I thought we would have seen this resolve itself already, but it hasn't. And that, that's the macro picture of why I'm so bullish on silver and gold. And, you know, my, the contrarian nature in me loves silver because it's so hated. It's the only commodity on the planet right now that's trading below where it was in 1980. And not just a little bit below where it was in 1980. It's less than half of where it was 40 years ago. And think about all the currency that's been created since then. So I think there's tremendous opportunity in silver for those with a one to call it one to five year time horizon. Um, you know, over the short term, anything is possible. A little bit of downside risk remains, but over the 
you know, multi-year time frame. I, I'm not. I, I am more bullish on silver than anything. How does how do we get here? How with silver? What can we look at the charts and get that information density to explain why silver is like seemingly undervalued? Yeah, I mean, it, it is quite perplexing. I think over the short term, in 2021, we kept getting this high inflation data, right? And then silver and gold would sell off on high inflation. And it seemingly was doing the opposite of what it should do. But I think the perception by the general market participants is that, oh, inflation's running hot. That means the Fed is going to get ahead of it and raise rates aggressively and squash inflation. So I think that's that's probably been the the reason for silver's lackluster performance over the last 18 to 24 months. Uh, however, I think you know the market's probably soon going to realize that that narrative is not correct <laughs> and that the Fed is not going to get ahead of inflation. They may raise interest rates nominally a few times, but they're not you know they're going to be behind the curve. Inflation is going to continue to run hotter than any normal or nominal interest rates. So we're going to have negative real rates. And I think as the market recognizes that, that's when silver really takes off. And I think that's probably likely to happen in 2022. If I were to like uh, superimpose a silver chart, say 200 day moving average uh, silver chart or something along those lines here, could you kind of talk, talk us through it? Yeah. Starting with a big long-term chart of silver, we've got this big cup and handle pattern forming that goes back over 40 years. And we're hugging the right hemisphere of, um, you know, that handle pattern. And there's appears to be a floor under right about $21 and 40 cents. And silver has been in this downtrending channel since February 1st. So as a technical analyst, I would say once we break above the upper rail of that channel, we're likely to, you know, see higher prices after that would be a, that would be a major buy signal, a break above that downtrend channel. Now, as far as the 200 day moving average, that's that's what makes silver a contrarian play is it's it's below a declining 200 day moving average so you know those institutions those trading algorithms are in a sell the rally mode right now um we're having a nice day here in silver on uh as we speak on tuesday but you know we're still below a declining 200 day moving average reclaiming that 200 day moving average i think is one of the first steps towards confirming a technical reversal in silver and then any other charts that you're looking at on the silver and any good examples of some of the, I guess, uh, technicals that we've discussed? Yeah, there's another chart that's really got my attention. And I, I like to compare uh, general equities to gold. And I also compare general equities to silver. So on the gold Dow chart, gold is just starting to try and break out against stocks. And that's very bullish because generalist investors, most of them could care less about the you know, under well, un underpinning thesis for gold and debt-based fiat currency and all that. They just want performance. So if they see gold beginning to outperform the stock market, that's going to get their attention and say, hey, you know what? Why don't I get some exposure to gold? Well, the same goes for silver. And right now, silver, uh, we talked about triangle patterns. When you measure silver against the Dow Jones, it's approaching the apex of a very well-defined triangle pattern. And we tend to not make it all the way to the apex. About two-thirds of the way to the apex of that triangle, you typically get a break one way or the other. So I'm looking for an upside breakout against stocks on silver. So that's another chart I'm looking at, silver versus the uh, Dow. Any other comments on silver, physical silver, <clears throat> namely, as an investment? Yeah, I guess in general, I, t I tend to think of physical metals as uh, insurance, as the with the goal being to preserve purchasing power. And then when I think about investing, I think about mining stocks. But to to drill down even further, I think of... Silver and gold as money, it's just a form of savings. When I think about investing, I think about royalty and streaming companies because they typically have cash flow. Those are investments that I want to have and I'm comfortable holding for a longer period of time. Mining stocks are inherently risky. I mean, they're one mining drill permit, one poor drill result away from you know, catastrophic losses. So I view those not as investments, but speculations. And um, you know, the further down the risk curve you go, the more speculative they get. Um, and I see a lot of newer investors, by the way, being overly allocated to explorers and developers when you know that leverage isn't always necessary. So anyway, I just wanted to make that distinction between, you know, um, investing and speculating. So let's dig a little bit into the equities. What should people be looking at in terms of gold and sil silver stocks in particular? So he, he, here's how I build my portfolio. There's no right or wrong, but for me, I start with metal. And I like to say, build your moat before your castle, because I look at that as defense. Physical metal is my defense, it's insurance, uh, where the equities are my offense. 
I like to build the foundation of my portfolio around royalty and streaming companies because I feel like they offer the most risk reward setup, the most favorable asymmetry. That doesn't mean that they, they may have a little bit less upside potential, but downside risk is minimal because they're, they're cash flow generating, you know, they generate positive cash flow. Um, from there, I'll go to a basket of exp, uh, producers. That's a little bit less risky. And then I take about 20% of my overall portfolio and allocate that towards explorers and developers. And the idea there is if just, you know, two thirds of them end up successful, but the other third go to zero, the, the winners make up for the losers. So, you know, I take a basket approach there and I take about 20% of my portfolio and allocate to those, that, that segment, explorers and developers. That's how I like to do it. And then what are you, who are some of the, uh, I mean, if, unless you don't like naming names, like companies that you think look good in these sectors? I think in this environment right here, right now. So I, I do ratio charts on different components of the precious metals complex. So I like to break the whole sector down into six subcomponents, physical gold, physical silver, junior silver miners, junior gold miners, and then senior gold miners, senior silver miners. And right now, from a ratio perspective, it's the junior silver miners that are the most undervalued uh, on a you know relative basis. So you know that's where the, my focus is right now is on silver miners. Th that said, I think the royalty and streaming companies in this environment where we're kind of trending lower um, are are presenting the most favorable risk reward setup. Um, you know the, those junior silver miners still have another you know, the downside risk remains. I, I, I'm very confident of where they're ultimately going, but you know, there, there's risk over the short term. So if, if you're going to speculate in those, be sure you know the risk you're taking. You ever seen these like Star Wars things coming out of, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know how to say the name of the country, New? New? Um, they are, there's Star Wars, there's Simpsons, there's uh, even kind of pop or soda brands. You seen any of this stuff? Um, No, with... No, I guess I'm not sure. Yeah, so there are uh, there's kind of an interesting market that has formed that in 20 years will either be like mocked or uh, you will be getting this stuff at a you know spot or will prove to kind of uh, maintain a little bit of value based on there only being so many of these coins that are uh, printed uh, or, or minted rather. Now, what are your thoughts on like precious metals art? which I guess I'll categorize these as, and I know there's different categories. What do you think about like, uh, the, you know, the intersection of art and precious metals? I'll show you an example. One moment. Sure. I bought, I bought this recently and this is like oh, cool. just something it's a, it's a baseball card, right? Yeah. But it's, it's one gram platinum. It's a Alex Rodriguez baseball card. It's one gram platinum. It was made from the nineties. I don't think you see that. And then yeah. uh, there's there's 25 of them. So this is an example of like precious metals based artwork that I think that on a long time horizon uh, has some potential. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. Um, I So that art is not my specialty, but however, I do get asked a lot about like numismatic coins or collectible coins. It's almost the same concept. And, you know, you can make a lot of money with those kind of things, but I, I would say it requires another skill set because how do you value something like that? You know, what, what's the premium above spot? Um, and I, I wouldn't, I don't have the skill set to properly, uh, you know, analyze something like that. If, if you do, I think that could be a unique niche. You do have the skill set, but we don't have the tool. We need like a chart that will chart, like, for instance, these Star Wars coins out of this mm -hmm. uh, Island Nation premiums so hmm. do we need to chart the premiums on these things like if i could chart the premiums on these over the last 30 years that would be interesting piece data yeah. bit for instance so you do have those uh, you, we do have uh, those skills you do we just don't have the tools so i think uh For the data the historical data and things like that yeah so i mean that's a, i think something that someone could look into last question how could silver outperform equities by a factor of 50. <laughs> yep um that sounds ridiculous uh, on, on its surface. However, it's happened before. So if we return to the ratio that we were at in 1980, where the last bull market peaked, silver peaked at 50 bucks, and the Dow peaked at 850, so it's at about a 17 to one ratio. Well, right now we're closer to 800 to one ratio. So if we return to that ratio that we were at in 1980, that would mean that physical silver outperforms the Dow Jones by a factor of just over 50 from current levels. And I, I do think that's going to happen, as outlandish as it may sound, and it's just history repeating.
Now that doesn't mean it's going to happen soon. It could take a handful of years. I think roughly 2026 is a good rough estimate, but I, I do think that's going to happen. It's happened before. I think it'll happen again. Could we see thousand dollars silver in the next eight years? The short answer is yes. But for me, once silver gets above $50, I think measuring it in US dollars or fiat currency, you know, it, the dollar is going to become an increasingly less reliable unit of account. So $1,000 silver may not mean much in five, six years from now. I mean, what does $1,000 get you? <laughs> so it all depends on inflation. Um, that's why I like the use of ratios so much. But yeah, I do think that's totally possible. What would you value silver in post $50? <clears throat> Uh, I like to measure it against gold. I like to measure it against real estate, um, against general equities, the stock market. Um, by the way, just because I'm not bearish on the bullish on the stock market now, I, I, I can't wait for a time where I can trade, you know, my metals and these speculative assets for just general equities and just be like every other normal person where you just set it and forget it. I think that day is coming, uh, but the ratios right now suggest we're, we've got a long way to go. Any other comments that people need to know in terms of either trading, charting, or silver? Um, yeah, I guess j just to reemphasize some of the things we talked about is, you know, there's investing and there's trading. They're very different games with a very different set of rules. So know what you're doing. Every time you push the buy button, have a subsequent plan to push the sell button. Know if you're an investor or a trader. If you're a trader, know what time frame you're trading in. Um, for me, I like to have separate dedicated accounts. So when I'm in my trading account, my mind is I'm applying my trading rules. If I'm in my longer term investing account, I'm applying my investing rules. So just a couple of things to think about. We've had the honor of sitting down today with Steve Penny, the silver chartist. You can get his e-letter at silverchartist.com. You can also follow him on Twitter at silverchartist. Thank you so much, Steve, for joining us today. You bet, Justin. Thanks so much for inviting me on. It was a great speaking with you. Pleasure's all mine. And thank you everyone for listening.